Okay, the idea behind insertion sort is we kind of separate our data into two separate lists, let's say, or collections. We have the unsorted and then the sorted. And every time we take something from the unsorted pile, we want to put it into the sorted bit, the list, in its correct spot. So when we were doing this two days ago with people based on height, every time we took someone, we did a linear search through everybody that was already in there to look for where they belong, the new one being added, where they should go, such that the list is still sorted. But now we'll talk about ones, it's a little different, it's selection sort, which I think you were the one that kind of explained it on Monday or whatever it was we were talking about it, where the idea here is just go through the unsorted stuff and find the smallest thing. And now you know you have the smallest thing. You can put it in the sorted list and you know exactly where it goes. Then you go through the unsorted bit again and you find the remaining smallest thing that must come after the element you just added, but will come before all the other elements because it's the smallest one, assuming we're sorting in ascending order. So that's the basic idea. That's what the algorithm is. The code, we can look at code for this. There, great. For i in range of the length of the list, okay, we're getting each index for each thing in the list. Then here, we just do another linear search from that element to the end to find the smallest element. That's it. And then once we find the smallest element, put it in the sorted thing. Repeat, 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 repeat. Remember, this is the code but the algorithm and the code are not one and the same. The code is an implementation of the algorithm. That's it. It's an expression of the set of instructions. It's an expression of the algorithm to say how you complete, how you can sort things using the strategy. All right, raise your hand if you want to get sorted this time with selection sort. One, two, just come down if you want. We'll need at least eight, I'd say. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, we're good with eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. So here's how we're going to do it. Actually, I'm going to have all of you stand over here this time. And I want you to stand kind of like Linearly. I want you to stand as if you're in a list, but you're not sorted in any way. So here's the execution of this algorithm. Again, I'm not like this, I'm not this like computing machine right here executing it. Like we are following this algorithm, but like here in real life. These algorithms can get executed wherever. We are the computing machinery taking place, are taking, being used right now to do this. So the idea is I'm going to do a linear search to find the shortest individual here. All right, it's you. Come on up, and I'm going to put you into the sorted list. You go right there. Great. Is this list sorted? Yes. Of course it is. Is this? No. It never is. It never was. All right, next shortest. OK, you're the shortest I've seen so far. No, 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 no. You might be. Let's have a quick comparison here. Did we do this yesterday? I can't remember. Yeah. Who, you came up shorter? Yeah. All right, so you're the small, you're the small, shortest remaining there. So we'll put you right after her. And we know we can put him after her because she was the shortest, shortest, shortest before. Meaning that she must be shorter than him because we didn't take him out until the next time. Meanwhile, we know that he is shorter than everyone else there because we just did a linear search. So if everybody else comes after him, we know he is at least in the correct spot. All right, another linear search. Okay, you're shortest I've seen so far. No, 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 no. Okay, we're gonna put you there. Again, we know he comes after him, but before all of them. All right, next shortest. This is now gonna get tough. I think probably you, maybe you could come stand over here and get a little closer to him. No, no, stay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you're short. All right, come on up. You go right there. Great. Another one. Get, get closer. I want to. Uh, oh. This is getting tough. I think maybe you two better compare each other here. 
What do we say? Oh my goodness. I think his hair is puffier. I, th- yeah, I got <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, you're next. You stand right there. Then another linear search. All right, I think it's you. Another linear search. Did we do this yesterday? I don't remember. Yes. Did we, who, who came up to tall? He was, he was tall. Yeah. You were? I was, yeah. Okay, all right. And you can come stand right here. Another linear search. Well, I don't really need to anymore. We know where he goes. And you go right there. Now, when doing this, I should have given you a heads up. When doing this, the key again is to consider how many steps are being done in terms of the size of the list. The size of this list is eight, but let's think of it in terms of n, more general. How many steps do I have to do? Well, I did a linear search every single time I went through the unsorted list to find the shortest person, right? And how much, like, what is a linear search? How much work does a linear search take? N. N. Linear. It takes linear work. N. I gotta look at everybody. And how many times did I have to do a linear search? N. N. I guess we could get fancy like N minus 1 because we didn't need to for you, I guess. But it's, it's like N. Right? Yeah. So if you, if you are doing something that takes N steps, N times, how much work is that? N squared. N squared. Exactly. Now, we'll have you go sit back down, but it'll probably be a lot shorter than yesterday. You'll be back up. We can get different people to get sorted. You might remember when talking about insertion sort that we we liked to, like I, I had you thinking about what was the configuration of the data and how did the configuration of the data affect how like, how many steps were required for insertion sort. We saw that if we just so happened to select the, the shortest individual every single time with insertion sort. This is selection. So this is going back to two days ago. If we randomly, just by dumb luck, selected the shortest person every time, added them to the sorted list, that's like the worst case scenario because every single time the next person out is going to be taller and I have to look through to find where they go. And if they always have to go to the end, meaning that they're taller than everybody else in the list, I've got to go through all however many things are in the sorted part. But the best case scenario was if I just happened to select the things out in reverse order. Where if I took the tallest person, put them here, then I end up just randomly selecting the next tallest person. Well, they must go in front of this one, so I didn't need to do any more comparisons other than one. Then I do it again. Oh, they're shorter, so they can go right in the front. Every single time I take someone out, I only have to do one comparison. And that was the best case scenario. That would be like n steps. Because if I have n people, I'm only ever doing one comparison for each of the n things. If we are doing n, if we are doing one thing n times, well, that's just n things. Now, Think about the configuration for selection sort. What would be the best and worst case configuration of the data to get like a good and bad luck scenario for selection sort? Take a second think or maybe talk amongst yourselves. Or is everyone just completely stuck? So what he's saying is, I have n individuals, and every single time, I have to do the full linear search. There's no getting lucky. Where I got lucky before was when I ended up finding out I never really needed to do a linear search. Where I just go like, oh, no, you just go right in front. I don't need to keep going. Where with selection sort, I have to do a full linear search every single time to guarantee that I find the smallest or shortest person remaining. I have to do the full linear search, and I have to do that n times. So there is no 
lucky case. This right here is always going to be n squared. It's always going to be quadratic because I can't, there's no getting, there's no way I can just get lucky with the configuration of data. I have to always do the full linear search. So this is always n squared. There's no, there's no getting just freakishly lucky like you could with insertion sort where we could get it where it was only n steps. So if you had to choose which algorithm you'd use, which one do you think would be a better choice? In terms of number of, total number of steps being done, you want to minimize that. Insertion, insertion right? Because selection is always going to be n squared. Where with insertion, you might get lucky. Why would you use that? Why would you? Um, well, it's not about using selection. It's about having it defined. But at the same time, wasn't it you that said that you used selection sort before? No, it's just the way they Oh, okay. But raise your hand if you think, you know what, I, I think I probably have actually done this before to sort things. I know I have, without really thinking about it. Why? Because it's so freaking easy to do. Find the smallest, find the next small, find the next small, find the next small. So we like selection sort because it's easy. Especially if you're doing it in real life, right? There's no like fancy overhead, no fancy data structures. It's just I've got a collection of things, find the smallest and the next and the next. It's easy. But it's funny how by taking the time, funny is not the right word, it's, it's, it's interesting that when you take the time to really think about how you sort things, you will discover that, huh, Turns out that that way of sorting stuff kind of sucks. But raise your hand if you've never put the thought into it like that before. Of course you haven't. Of course you haven't. But this is where computer scientists really love to geek out. Where we love to go like, okay, so what are the steps you did? Can we do that better? Is that better or is that worse? Why is it worse? How is it better? You know? So by taking the time to really think and consider about what? are like the atomic steps of this algorithm. How many are there? It gives you some insight into maybe a decision. If you had to use a sorting algorithm, which would you use based on what you learned? Well, insertion. Now for a really fun one, bubble sort. Bubble sort is named because, well, we'll, we'll come back to the name in a moment. But bubble sort is really, it's another really simple one. If I'm ever looking at two individuals that are out of order, I'll put them in order. Flip them. Right? If you have two people standing next to each other and the shorter person's on this side, well, that's not correct. So how can I help make it slightly better? Put them on that side. Right? It's easy. And if you keep doing this over and over and over and over and over and over and over until no one's out of order anymore, you'll get a sorted collection of things. It'll work. Now, arbitrarily, like I want to be very clear, when doing bubble sort, the order in which you do the flips doesn't matter. You'll end up with a sorted thing in the end. But I mean, it's, computers don't like being told, just do whatever order you want. So we systematically will do scans. We'll start at the beginning and go. And if we see anything out of order, we flip them. Then we start again. And then we start again. And so on and so on and so on until it's all done. Just because it's, you know, it's very systematic to do it that way. So bubble sort is great. Now, do I have... Okay, I do not. And here's like the algorithm for it. Now this algorithm right here is, is a mildly and gently optimized version of the bubble sort because we create this flag called swap something and we start it as true. What do we have? While swap something is true, we immediately set it to false. Then we do a scan of the list for i to the length of i minus 1 actually, length of i, length of the list minus 1. And the minus one is super important. The number of times people will make this mistake, the number of times you, if you continue programming in your life, the number of times you will make this mistake, I want you to remember 
Because you'll do it a lot. I want you to remember, on November 26, 2021, James said that I'm totally going to make this mistake. Every single time you make this mistake, I want you to think about today. Because I'm telling you right now, you're going to make this mistake. I do it all the time. And these sometimes are really hard to find. But you'll notice that I'm saying if in list at i is greater than in list at i plus 1, well, then I need to swap. If the thing here is bigger than this thing, they're out of order. Therefore, swap them. Makes sense. Now, why do we have to go to the length minus 1? Well, because I'm always comparing i to i plus 1. And if i is ever, like if the length of the list is 10, and i is 9, and I tried to compare index 9 to index 10, is that possible? No. Index 10 doesn't exist. So because we're looking at i and i plus 1, we have to be careful. Sometimes I like to think like, really what we're doing here is we're not putting our finger on each individual element in the list. We're putting our finger on each pair of elements in the list. And the number of pairs of it, like sequential pairs, is always like n minus 1, length minus 1, right? If there's 10 spots, well, then there's 9, u2, 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 you know? Whatever. This, that's how I always thought about it. If it helps you, great. If not, whatever. So that's bubble sort. We loop through the list. If something is out of order, you swap it, and then you set the flag to true. Then that while loop, once that inner for loop finishes, it goes back to the top and it goes to that while loop. If we ever swap something, we know we need to keep going. Because if we ever made a swap, it might still be unsorted. But if I ever do a scan and find that nothing was out of order, what can I conclude? It's in order. It's exactly. I like the way you put it. If everything's, if nothing's not in order, then they're in order. <laughs> so that's bubble sort. All right. So let's get eight people down here again. It could be the same eight. It could be different eight. Whatever. I don't care. We're going to do bubble sort. This will be the last one we do together. This is the last sort. So now or never. And you're all going to start up here. So this sort is really easy to have it work like in the same collection. The others are too, but this one's really easy. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Perfect. We've got 9. This is great. Just line up here and make no attempts to be sorted. If you do, you're ruining it. You're, you're ruining the point. And this is the one that I find the easiest for me right now because you're always comparing people that are adjacent, so it's easy to tell the difference in the height. So, here's what we do. Now, before I start, three things I want you to think about. One, what would the best case scenario be? Two, what would the worst case scenario be? Three, how many would I have to do to guarantee that it's sorted, no matter what? And a fourth one. Where, like, try to get a sense of, hmm, who's the tallest person in this list? It's probably you, right? All right. I want you to, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up in, in one moment. We're going to start down at this end. Let me put on my map so I'm not spitting on all of you. All right. Are they out of order? Yeah. All right. Swap. <laughs> Are they out of order? Swap. Are they out of order? Yeah. There are more people in the room. Are they out of order? Yeah. Are they out of order? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they are. Yeah. Are they out of order? Are they out of order? Yes. Are they out of order? Yes. All right. We did one pass. Is this list sorted? No. No, absolutely not. One pass is not enough. But what did you 
notice, like what's interesting about the last element in this list now? It's the tallest. It's the tallest. Whenever doing a single pass of bubble sort, you're guaranteed to have the biggest thing, or the thing that should be at the end, at the end. The next pass, what do you think will be right next to him? Me. Why? Because <laughs> I'm the next tallest. Exactly. So we got to do another pass. Are they out of order? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I'm trying to make a little more room. Are they out of order? Yeah. Are they out of order? Yeah. Are they out of order? No. Are they out of order? Yeah. Are they out of order? Yeah. Are they out of order? Yeah. Are we done? No. <laughs> Start again. Are they out of order? Yeah. Right? We did this yesterday. I think? Yeah, they're out of order. You think so? Yeah, I think just. So are they out of order? Yeah, okay, swap. Are they out of order? Yes. Alright. Are they out of order? No. Are they out of order? No. Are they out of order? Yeah. Well, hey, where are you going? Oh. You're good. <laughs> are they out of order? Yes. Now you're good. And I guess we don't really need to compare anymore, do we? Because we, we know that he must be in the right spot. All right, cool. So, is it done? Yeah. No. So, we start again. Are they out of order? Yes. Are they out of order? No. Are they out of order? Are they out of order? Yes. Swap. Sugar. Are they out of order? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. And I guess we don't need this comparison. Is it sorted? Yeah. Ah, I like your answer because I don't really know. Yeah. Because I did a pass and I had to make swaps, so I can't guarantee it's sorted. So let's try again. Are they in order? Yeah. yeah. I guess are they out of order? Are they out of order? No. Are they out of order? No. Are they out of order? No. Well, I guess we already put they were there. So now that I did a whole pass, and I found that no one is out of order, I know that this list is now in order. Right? So bubble sort, every pass, the biggest thing bubbles up to the top. It's a bit of a stretch name, I know, but whatever, go with it. You, you got bubbled up to the top, and then you got bubbled up, and then you got bubbled up, and so on. Now, let's think of the best case scenario. Does anyone have an idea of the best case scenario? Yes. Good. This situation. Because here's how I would go. I would say, are you out of order? No. Out of order? No. Out of order? Oh, I made one swap, so I'm done. How many steps did that take me? N. N. I had to look at all of them. I guess N minus 1, you know, whatever. N. So that's the best case scenario. What's the worst case scenario? The exact opposite. The opposite. If I wanted to sort the other way, oh, how many passes would I have to do, though? N. So let's think. After one pass, I'm guaranteed to have the tallest person in their correct spot. Right? Each pass takes me n steps. And if after one pass, the tallest person is in the right spot, after two passes, the next tallest person is in the right spot, how many passes must I do to guarantee that this is sorted? N factorial. No. For the whole thing? And we have to do n passes because after one pass he's in the right spot, another pass he's in the right spot, another pass he's in the right spot, another pass, another pass, another pass, another pass, another pass, another pass. 
So it would be n passes. At most, it would only ever take, at most, n passes. But I have to do n, and I need to do n passes, and each pass takes n. Now, with the implementation where I didn't actually have to compare these two that second time, or anybody else as we go, it's kind of that like half square thing I drew the other day, but it's still quadratic, it's still n squared. There was, what were the four things I wanted to look at? Best case, worst case? Standard case. The standard case, well that's like what we just had. Yeah. Best case, worst case? Number of success to be guaranteed. Right, so to answer that question, which we totally just did, how many passes must you do to guarantee that it's sorted? N plus one. N. Really just N. Yeah. Just N. Do N minus one. Plus okay, I hear what you're saying, because then you would have to do one more pass to say that it's sorted. But what we could do, so you're absolutely right. So his point, he said n plus 1 passes. And if we go with the algorithm as it is explained the first time, he's right because I would have to do that plus 1 pass to check that nothing else was out of order. But because I know that after n passes, it must be sorted, if I ever get to that case and I do that nth pass, there's no need to do that additional one. Because if I did n, I know it must be sorted, even though I made a swap. But that's just getting fancy. Anyways, let's face the props for all their hard work. All right, so, and then last I have BOGO sort, which I think was the first one we actually talked about, about like shuffling that deck of cards. Good luck. So don't do BOGO. So you might remember when we talked about binary search. We had linear search and binary search. Binary search, pardon me, was way better than linear. But what was the catch of binary search? What had to be the case in order for binary search to work? You had to say upper or lower. That's just another fancy way of saying they had to be in order. That I could say upper or lower. If I know everything over here is less than me, then if you say lower, I know that the, you know, the number smaller must be over there. So, yes. The elements need to be in order for that binary search to work. So. We saw the linear search go from n steps down to log n steps, log base 2 n steps with binary search. So if we come along and sort our data, we now can do our searches way faster than we could with linear search, which is awesome. If we can do something in log base 2 steps versus n steps, that is huge. Like if you come along and you find it, you get a job at Amazon and you find one of their algorithms that takes linear time and the, like linear time is great. If you have a linear time algorithm for something, that's usually pretty good. But if you come along and discover that like, you know what, if you change this implementation to this, you get a, you get a log base to n number of steps and that's faster. You're going to get like a million dollar bonus that year because that, those are like the really big, core, awesome, important things. But I'm just saying, oh, but just sort the data. But how much work that we've seen so far, how much work did sorting the data, data cost us? How many steps? Come on, we, we literally just spent all of this and like all of last class talking about this. How many steps? N squared. You know, don't ask it like it's. A, don't ask me the question. I'm asking you the question. The. It's n squared, right? We always think about that worst case scenario. We had to do n linear searches, you know. So right now it sounds like I'm telling you to go from something that takes n steps to get it down to log n steps. 
do something that takes n squared steps, which seems like, well, that's a hell of a lot more work just to get a little bit of an improvement over there. And you're not wrong. You're at, like, that's correct. But you only need to sort the data once. And if you have to do like a bajillion searches, that's fantastic. You get a huge speed up from that. Or maybe the data you got is already sorted. Or maybe the data coming in is coming in the stream that happens to be sorted. I don't know. But sorting, and it, at, at this point you're like sorting. Yeah, whatever. This is stupid. We all know how to sort things. Well, hold on. Remember, we just spent time really analyzing these algorithms that you have all done before but never thought about. And by taking the time to think about them, you kind of got a sense of best case scenario, worst case scenario. That algorithm actually might have a best case scenario where that one doesn't. But you've never thought of that before. But now you know. The truth, though, is that all these sorts suck. <clears throat> they are not very good sorting algorithms. There are better sorting algorithms out there that are better than n squared. And one of the examples we saw was that like bucket idea. Where at the end of this semester, I'm going to have like 150 exams. And I'm going to want them sorted alphabetically-ish. Enough that if I need to get find someone, I can find them easier than just doing a whole search through all 150. So what I'm going to do is I'll make a pile for A, B, C, D. And every single person, I read their last name. Whatever letter it starts with, I put them in that bucket. When I'm done, I collect all the buckets. Now my data is mostly in order. I have... I have 26 buckets. Each bucket isn't sorted, but it's sorted enough. It's only going to be the M's that really throw me off because there's so many M's last name. But if someone says, oh, I, you know, I want to see my exam, what's your last name? Oh, all right. Well, I can now kind of do like a binary search for it because I know if I look at a letter and go like, oh, we're at M, but you're a, a W. I know that, well, it's better, I better keep looking on this side, not that side. How many steps does that bucket sort take, though? I have 26 buckets. I have n things I need to sort. How much work is it? N. N. It's linear. That's a linear <coughs> search, which is fantastic. But there's, like, catches to it, right? It's like, well, it's not really sorted, and it required that we knew a lot about the data beforehand. I knew that 26 buckets was going to be perfect. So it's not very general, but it can be used very well. When sorting things in real life, if you can get away with bucket sort, that's going to be, like, your, your really good choice. It's because it's just going to be the fastest. Now... There are, though, more general algorithms that are way better than n squared, though. But the trouble with those is that, well, first, they get a little bit more complex. And on top of it, they have a lot of, like, overhead associated with them that it becomes impractical to do it in real life. That's why we like to, you know, do it on the computers. But there are more better search strategies out there, or search sorting strategies out there, which are really interesting, that, that, that work on some very basic principles. And here, I'll give, you, I'll give you a hint of two of the principles they work on. One, two and a half hints. <clears throat> Is an empty list sorted? Yes. yes. And if you're like, well, I mean, let me put it this way. Is an empty, within an empty list, is anything out of order? No. In a list with one element in it, is it sorted? Yes. Now, here's the other big idea. If I have a list of things that are sorted over here, and I have another list of things that are sorted over here, and I know that everything in this list is less than everything in this list, and everything in this list is bigger than everything in that list, if I take those two lists, Put them together, what do I get? A sorted list, which is bigger. That's one of the tricks. There's another trick, to, depending on the algorithm you use, is it's really easy to merge two sorted lists where you don't know if everything over here is bigger than everything over here or vice versa. 
you just have two collections of data where they're both sorted. There's a really easy way to take them and combine them, like zip them together, merge them, to end up with a bigger sorted list. Really easy piece. But a lot of it comes down to kind of knowing or just being aware that an empty list or a list with one thing in it is sorted, which is neat. Oh, and you can go to this website and visualize. Make sure my volume is not on because sometimes it plays noise. All right, I'm going to try to zoom in. So. When I hit play, it's going to play all. It's going to do insertion, selection, bubble, shell, merge, heap, quick, quick three. And it has four different scenarios. One is when the data is just randomly ordered. Another one is when the data is nearly in order. Another one when the data is absolutely in reverse order. And the other one where you have data where there's few uniques. There's a lot of values with the same value. I'm going to hit play and just, just see how they, you know, it's kind of funny. Try to get a sense of which one's done first and which ones are slow. I'm going to do it again. Keep an eye out for which ones are the worst, are the slowest. If you had to pick the worst three, which are they? Exactly, insertion, selection, and bubble, the ones we just learned. I want to be very clear though, these algorithms aren't bad algorithms. The, these are, they're intuitive, they're easy, you've all done them thinking whether you thought about it or not, and it, they work. And a lot of times if we're sorting things, it's not going to be some huge amount of crap. Yeah. Because there's no best or worst case scenario. It comes down to that. So, Remember with like bubble, we can get really lucky. If the data's already in order, we're done. With uh, insertion, if the data came in in reverse order, it was really quick. In fact, let's watch selection with reversed order. What? No, that's, wait, selection. I meant insertion. Stop, stop, stop. Well, whatever. Look how quick it is. Why? Why is it always selecting the last one? Whatever, they must have have a different implementation. Remember how I said like, oh, reverse order or in order? Depending on your implementation, that could get flipped. Where the best case is if they're in reverse order or, or vice versa. It just depends on how you implement it or where you start the scan from. For example, a common way with, uh, with insertion sort, a common way to do it, and I bet this is what their implementation is, in fact, Remember how with insertion sort, that's where I took someone and then put them, I inserted them into the sorted list, remember? How I had like two separate lists. It's common with insertion sort to, all right, come on. God, it's so slow. To have the sorted and unsorted stuff be in the same list. That is the Yeah, it's a really slow animation. But like, I know that those are the sorted parts. So notice that here it's doing the scan in reverse order. So that's why that example was actually not great. But it depends on if you start scanning it here or here, whether or not reverse order or in order helps the most. But those are what we would call implementation details. The idea is the same. Yeah. Sorry? Quick and quick three, I actually don't even know what quick three is. It's probably just quick sort with a little twist. <clears throat> Where did it go? Oh, right, I closed it. Quick and quick three. Okay, I want to have a... Can 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Quick 3 seems to have some interesting extra little steps, and it, obviously it's based on Quick, but. No, like that's not what's happening. That's absolutely incorrect. It looks like it, though. Might just be the way I, the way it Where the heck did I put? Oh, no, did I close it? Yeah. All right. Go back. All right, cool. So now for, I think, my favorite thing to talk about. This is, we won't get into it today. We'll start this really next week. But this topic is my favorite one, because this is the basis of everything we've been doing so far. It's funny. You learn the fundamental computer science stuff. You learn the fundamentals, the start, the roots, what it all means, where it came from. Last. It's weird. This is like fourth year crap, which is weird. You'd think, like, well, why don't you start at the beginning? Well, because it's, it's complicated. Because really, computer science is math, especially this stuff. This stuff is like, this stuff makes it really obvious that it's just fancy math. So it requires a lot of information in order to start. But here I give you a bit of a primer for more advanced topics and things that, things that we really Things that we care about, things that, like, if I design a computer that can, that works like this, what can it do? And what if I make this little change to that computer? Can it do more or less? Can it do the same? Can you prove that it can do more? These are the types of things we care about. This, at this point, that's very abstract. I'm talking about words and ideas that you're very unfamiliar with. I know. And I'm going to give you a scratching of the surface of these ideas here. But this is the, this is the fun stuff. This is where... This is where you really... I'm trying to think of how to say this well. This is where you really get a chance to see... Raise your hand if you like this class because you know you, you like when you get to a problem and it's kind of like a puzzle. And then when you solve it, you're like, yeah, I feel amazing. Yeah, of course, right? That's an awesome thing. This is kind of like the roots of that. I'm explaining this horribly, but this is like where we get to say, like, you know, if you've designed your computing machine like this, we can really make some awesome assertions about what it can and can't do, what problems it can solve, and what problems it can't solve, and why they can't, and why that one can't. This is where you, you really get to sink your teeth into computing. So at the beginning, at the end of the day, a computer is very, 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 very straightforward. Now, you all have been remarkably misled, because if I say point to a computer, what are you going to do? You're going to point to this thing, right? Oh, you're getting fancy though, because you are. A computer is something that computes stuff, which is really a ridiculous statement, right? It sounds like you're defining it in terms of itself. But at the end of the day, a computer can take input, can produce output, it can make calculations, it can keep track of states, it can make decisions. That's what a computer is. And you saw that, like, I, I showed you the code for bubble insertion and selection sort. And that would work. I could run it, and the, that computer right there would do the sorting. But we didn't, I never actually hit run on any of those sorts on the computer, did I? We sorted humans. We were the things computing. I'm not being all, oh, wow, if you think about it. No, I'm saying, like, literally we were. I'm not trying to get all philosophical. No, we were, by every most literal meaning of the words. We computed to get a sorted collection of people based on height. 
So we were the computers, but anything could be a computer. A simple lock and key is a computer. It takes input, it can produce some sort of output, like lock, unlocking a door, and it has a state. It's, it might feel silly to think of a lock as a computer, but it is. And finite state machines are typically our most basic, fundamental, computer definition ever. It's very simple, but it can do a lot. This stupid little computer design can do a lot. Not everything. There's a lot it can't do. But a lot of people think like, oh, because it's the least powerful, it can't do very much. Well, no, it can do a lot. Your traffic lights don't need to be any more sophisticated than this. Your locks don't need to be your safes. Your, your vending machine, like, a lot of stuff things that you use don't need to be particularly sophisticated. So finite state machines are very, very, very simple. You have an input state. You can have a final state that produces some output or condition or something. And you can move between states. So I can define something like a safe. Maybe it's, a, it's a, or a lock on a door, like a combination lock, that requires that I put in a code to unlock the door. I could represent that computer as this little machine. I mean, we're obviously not physically building this computer. We could. It would be kind of silly, but we could do it. But we'll think of it abstractly as this drawing. And we start at this state. And this right here, this computer can take input, the digits 0 through 9. If I'm starting at that state, the state with the arrow pointing to it, that's like the convention. If I'm starting at that state and I see the number 7, I follow that path to the next state. If I see another 7, I follow the path to the next state. And then if I see a 3, I follow to the next state, which happens to be the final state, the lock unlocks. But if at any point along the way, if I see anything that's not a 7, not, like I just, not, I don't get anywhere. So as I go, 7, oh, 7, 4, oh, I've got to start at the beginning, because that's not the right combination. It has to be the right combination in the right order. Like it's got to be the numbers in the right order. This right here does that. That simple little finite state machine. This little configuration of a computer is good enough for a lock. That's it. And another interesting thing that goes with this is an idea called regular expressions. Raise your hand if you've heard the word regular expression before. So regular expressions and finite state machines are like equivalent. Any regular expression you can represent with a finite state machine. Any finite state machine you can rep represent with a, a regular expression. Now, what a regular expression is, we'll talk about that on Tuesday. But it's kind of like the language, the, the problems, the world in which this computer can do its thing. All possible configurations of things. We'll talk about this on Tuesday. I'll see you then.